What's up, my ninjas? I'm Striden, and I am back with a review. Actually, finished watching uh, Justice League Throne of Adva Atlantis, wow, last night, and I figured, let me get this shit up here so you guys can hear the good, the bad, the in-between, just the overall thoughts and impressions of the film. So, I'm going to jump into it ASAP. So, straight up, this is the retelling, reimagining the, uh, I don't know, translation of Jeff John's work on the New 52 Aquaman arc called, it was the second Justice League arc called Throne of Atlantis. The, uh, I don't know, there's, there's one inherent issue with the way that these things were done, and I guess it's an issue if you were a comic book reader and you expected it to follow exactly how it worked in the books. Um, for some reason, they took Aquaman out of the first movie, which was Justice League War, and then they set up this for him, straight up, you know, his own little arc, because technically this is big enough for him to be the star of. And I understand that, and it's, you know, it's not an issue for me, but it is weird because, you know, number one, he was already part of the Justice League when this started, you know. There's a very iconic scene, which I have in this video, um, and actually they, they took it out of war and made it part of Throne of Atlantis. Um, and I guess since these are standalone stories, you know, like these, this is its own continuity, I guess it works, but I'm kind of tired of every time uh, something is uh, adopted for the screen, it becomes its own continuity instead of just following the continuity that is established with minor tweaks to the story. So, you know, for those of you who, you know, that doesn't bother you, which there's this huge majority of people who read books but don't really care about how the subject matter is translated, um, then, I mean, this wouldn't be an issue for you. For people like me, who I want it to reflect what I've been reading, because if it's good enough to make a movie, that means it was good enough for you to follow, you know, the, the model that was set in the source material, it'll be a problem for people like, you know, like me. So it was a mild problem. I won't say that it, like you know, stopped me from enjoying the film, you know. Um, the biggest thing I want to get out of the way, it's light years better than uh, Justice League War. It's more fully realized characters, uh, motivations and their plots, their arcs, their, you know, everything is a little bit more fleshed out. Even characters who you only see for a couple seconds doing something else other than pushing this plot along for Aquaman, like characters like Superman and Wonder Woman, they feel more human, they feel more like three-dimensional characters in this, even though you only see them doing other things than fighting for a couple seconds, maybe a couple minutes before all the fighting and stuff starts happening. And I dug that. So yeah, this was way better. Um, Ethan Spaulding, he's a good com comedic director, and I've never really liked his action stuff. I way, way, way prefer Jay Oliva. I think he's a thousand percent better director. But Ethan Spaulding wasn't, he didn't do a bad job here with the direction. Now understand the direction is how things are framed, shot, you know, what things look like. It's not the writing. Uh, a lot of people on YouTube have this, this misconception that Directors always write the material that they direct. That's not the, the, the way it goes. Now, um, the movie begins with an attack on a sub. Essentially, you've got some soldiers. You know, one soldier's kids are, you know, he, he loves the Justice League. The soldiers kind of exclaim about how it's hard to compare to Superman and characters like that. And uh, then they, they quickly get d dispatched. And you know this plot, because this whole story was an episode of Justice League Unlimited with a handful, or Justice League in general. And it, it just had a hand, this movie tweaks that story just a handful of ways. Um, it's, it's one of my criticisms of Jeff Johns is that like when he does change things, it, with the exception of Green Lantern, who he obviously is a fan of, he doesn't really explore like in crazy options that are way outside of what you would expect. You know what I mean? Like, a lot of times it feels like he just tweaks it enough so you can say it's different, and, you know, that's it. 
with the exception of the Green Lanterns, where with the Green Lantern, you know, War of Light, he went nuts with all the details and with all the, the, the different uh, concepts for the Green Lanterns that they feel so different from what we know the Green Lanterns to be. And some of that is good and some of that is bad. I mean, the fact that he took the individuality away from all of the Green Lanterns that you could see through their constructs, that pisses me off greatly. So, you know, this is what you're working with when you come into these films. So anyway, the tanker, the uh, tanker, I said, the submarine is attacked. The soldiers are dispatched. You know who did it. If you've read this stuff before, you know. If you've seen Aquaman before on TV, if you've seen him before, like really watched episodes with him, if you've seen his introduction in Justice League, you know what where this is going. Um, then it cuts to uh, Arthur in a bar having a shitty day. Uh, it seems like everything is going wrong for him. His father just passed away. Um, he's talking to, he's drinking heavily in a bar, and he's talking to a lobster. Um, when the... I guess owner of the bar, the cook goes to pick up that lobster to cook a dish. Uh, Arthur intervenes. The guy whose food was about to be uh, prepared uh, steps in. He's a big black dude. And there's this big bar brawl that fight. It starts inside and then flies outside. And Arthur is winning. I mean, he receives a lot of punishment, but he wins this fight hands down because he's Aquaman. His body can withstand great punishment because. He can stand up to the pressures of the deep, you know, in the ocean. Uh, two different characters are watching. Uh, one character turns out to be Mara, who is sent by Queen Atlanta to watch her son. Uh, and the other is Dr. Shin, who received a letter from Arthur's father, kind of with a lot of questions about Atlantis and such, because Dr. Shin is the world's foremost... Uh, authority on Atlantis. So, um, the, uh, let's see, Cyborg. Cyborg, who gets a big part in this story? I mean, a huge part. He's like front and center. And it's, it's, it's cool because he's a character that, you know, I expected to be kind of sidelined. Um, he goes to investigate. Of course, he finds out more details and then he's attacked um and he's attacked by the exact same people that attacked the uh sub the first time or similar to the people that attacked the sub the first time he and then as, as he's escaping he manages to kill off the three of them um then uh let's see he puts out a summons for the rest of the justice league they all come in from different parts. Wonder Woman and Superman are hanging out together, going out on their date. I think it was clever that they worked that aspect of the Justice League story into uh, this particular, you know, thing. Uh, you even get a little bit of how uh, Lois Lane is jealous that he's out with, you know, a super fine chick that's not her and not necessarily, uh, you know, messing it up. You know, they're enjoying each other's time. Um I like that. I think it works. I mean, obviously, you changing the dynamic from Soups and Lois to Soups and Wonder Woman is kind of like a, uh, you know, I think it's kind of generic. But at the same time, as someone that he dated early, you know, and maybe, you know, obviously it's not going to work out forever because they're still kind of alluding to the uh, Lois and Clark thing. Because, I mean, it just makes sense. Um it, it, it still works, you know. But anyway, uh, all the heroes are out doing different things. Uh, Hal's hitting on a chick, of course, trying to, you know, get her to go out with her. He gets her number. And then, of course, the Flash shows up and interrupts it. You, you Many of you have probably seen that clip already. Um, they all end up at Star Labs where Cyborg, I guess, is calling his home now. Um, everyone except for Batman, of course. Batman's doing his own thing in Gotham. Green Lantern goes to Gotham, kind of fucks up the whole situation, trying to showboat and show that he's so great. He, like, destroys the bad guys. But Batman needs to question them. And that didn't help. Anyway, Batman shows up later, and they all start watching this cool effect that Cyborg has, where he can kind of, like, recreate a scene in three dimensions, like a projection in three dimensions, so that people can see what he saw or see what whoever saw almost like you're there 
the, the, the one thing I didn't get was he was going through the motions of, of like what he did, how he got hit, blah, 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 you know, and I'm like, if it's a 3D project projection, couldn't you just project yourself so you could watch what you went through? I don't see a reason for him to sit there and pantomime exactly what he did in the first place. You know what I mean? It just seemed, that seemed weird. Once again, it does, it's not a deal breaker. It's just me rationalizing what I saw. Uh, they discover Atlantis is uh, somehow at the root of this because Wonder Woman recognizes the weapon that was used to attack Cyborg when he was checking out the submarine. And uh, they start this search, and their search brings them to Atlantis. And it was really cool for you to see Cyborg's many uses. Cyborg was able to like cross-reference data and link up with Batman's uh, cowl, you know, computer and all that stuff. He was like seeing through Batman's eyes and then Batman was relaying information to him. It was just like, damn, and he was doing everything super fast. Like uh, he was cross-referencing every known piece of information on Atlantis in like an instant. And it was like, okay, see, this is what makes him He's kind of like Void on Wildcats in a sense, you know, that like all-purpose supercomputer that can do just about anything. And I dig that because not only does he have ridiculous combat capabilities, which in this movie were watered down um, in comparison to Justice League War, um, but he has, you know, high-level combat in, uh, abilities. And then on top of that, he has all these other uses that, you know, it just helps make things uh, work. You know, it helps make him more uh, uh, necessary. We're quickly shown in the you know earlier parts of the film that Orm is the son of the previous king. And during the events of Justice League War, his father was killed. That was the, the end sequence in Justice League War. And uh, he doesn't really care about the, his stepmother. Essentially, he just wants the throne. He has Black Manta working with him, who's helping kind of put the wrong information in his ear so that he could capitalize off of it. And it's crazy, too, because it's really subtle stuff. He's not doing anything like super generic Saturday morning cartoon villainish. I mean, he does one thing, uh, and this is uh, Black Manta I'm talking about. He does one thing in the film that's 100% uh, cartoony you know, like Saturday morning cartoony, and it ends up being his demise. But anyway, he's pretty much egging on uh, the soon-to-be Ocean Master, which is Prince Orm. And uh, Orm doesn't give a shit about his, his stepmother. He just wants the power. He wants to have the, uh, you know, the, 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 the throne, essentially. And he's just pissed. He wants his vengeance, and he doesn't care if a lot of the, uh, his reasoning is not sound. He just wants to take his revenge on them. And, you know, like I said, Black Manta being there does not help. Uh, I like the, the the relationship that was there, although I thought it was strange that they didn't question Black Mantha, Mantha, Manta being the only surface dweller hanging out in freaking Atlantis. Like, no one said, like, so why is this guy here and who is he? They didn't even quite like mention, you know, is he Atlantean? They didn't mention why he needs a breathing apparatus underwater. None of that shit. You just have to know because you read comics. These are the kind of things that I'm saying that this new team, they don't add anything to the subject matter. They just take things away. And there's areas they could explore that they choose not to. And it keeps it from being great. The way that Bruce Tim and the various teams underneath Tim would rewrite and add depth to things that needed it. So there's a lot of, uh, you know, moments where uh, once the, there is the double cross, there's the big double cross that takes place. Um, once all the shit starts hitting the fan, and I'm leaving certain things out because I don't want to completely spoil it, but like I said, if you've read the books, you know what's coming. Um, for, uh, uh, how do I put this? For characters like uh, Ocean Master fighting, you know, Aquaman, and for, you know, the League actually trying to fight Ocean Master, they just made his fucking scepter or the, the, the trident just infinitely powerful. It just, 
had the the all-purpose kind of magical powers that i mean he he turned shazam back into a kid and i'm like how would you know what magic to use to do that to shazam if you've never even seen him before like you've never dealt with him you didn't study up on him nothing how would you just magically be able to hit him with something to turn him back into billy batson i'm like that's just convenient um, there's a lot of times where he's taking everybody on and you're saying to yourself, how can he withstand a punch from Superman, like a sucker punch from Superman, you know, and how can he just stab Superman and it's done? I guess the magic portion, that's your answer for, for the stabbing, but like as far as just easily taking punishment from the league like that, you know, Wonder Woman and Superman, like uh, I don't, I don't see it, but you know, this was what was going on in the story. Essentially, uh, Orm sends a bunch of goons to get Arthur and to kill Dr. Shin. Mara saves Arthur. They come back to the uh, you know, to Atlantis so she can show Arthur what's going on. Um, they meet Orm, who is now, he's taken over. He's killed Queen Atlanta, which is actually a really well done scene. It's fucked up because of the timing, but it's a well done scene. Arthur is kind of like, I'm going to kill the guy who does it. Uh, who did it, I'm sorry, uh, Orm shows up and says, you know, pretty much, it was me, you know, and he takes down the entire league, like they're nothing, well, with the exception of Batman and the Flash, they're over at, uh, Star Labs, and they're pretty much trying to work on a plan, I think it's Batman, the Flash, and, and, uh, Shazam, they're still in Star Labs, now, I'm focusing a lot on Orm, because if he's the big baddie, and we're supposed to fear him, and his situation is supposed to be so bad. Essentially, he's playing this the way that Namor would have handled this situation, you know? The surface dwellers killed one of ours, and now we have to spill, you know, surface dweller blood. And that's the way that Orm is playing. But, like, the difference is the Submariner uh, never... His stance has never really changed. He doesn't really like the surface dwellers. And if they do something to provoke him, he's just like, I'm going to fuck you up. And it's done. And it's known that this is the way it's going to be. Similar to how uh, uh, T'Challa is. If you trespass on Wakandan soil, he's going to take your head off. It's that simple. You know, the thing with this is Orm hates the surface and we get that. But you only have this one instance. There was never like mentions of other instances where, you know, Atlanteans just murdered folks that got too close to Atlantis. You know what I'm saying? Or like, like we don't get to see how crazy this guy is. It seems like he's only crazy because his father was killed. But then it's like, so then he's not really a villain. But then as you watch the, the story unfold, he's just doing villainous things just because and I guess one could say that it's Black uh, Manta, but the fact that no one questioned Black Manta kind of cheapens how that would work. I mean, do you see how all these things could play into one another? Like people questioning Black Manta, then Manta has to, you know, do things to cover his own ass. And then, you know, Orm would have to do things to cover for Black Manta. And the two of them develop more of a bond. And you see why they're so tight as far as this, this, this quote unquote struggle. Um, it just seemed very empty. And then, you know, in the final climactic showdown, like I said earlier, Orm is like just the fucking deus ex machina, you know, him having that trident, just, he was too damn powerful and it didn't make sense. And it all ends with this climax of Aquaman just punching him in the face. <laughs> it was like, huh? Like the movie was actually pretty good until Orm started, until Orm got this freaking trident, and then it just seemed like, wait, what? Like, it wasn't very defined what this trident does, because, you know, in mythology, Poseidon's trident actually controls storms, and it controls, uh, like, weather, and it, control, it can summon lightning, and it can control the oceans and the winds and blah, 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 but I don't know what was going on in this film. It did everything. But Aquaman punches him in the face, his nose bleeds, he's knocked the fuck out, and it's done. And I was like, wow, that's pretty lame. And then all of a sudden, Homeboy is giving speeches and stuff. And he's like, yeah, we have to all kind of come together, blah, 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 blah. And it's like, huh, okay. And then him and, you know, what's her name, Kiss, and it's all good. Um, the rest of the league is in the movie. They, they're not 
completely sidelined, but they're not cons completely given a lot to do, which makes me wonder why they didn't just make this an Aquaman movie guest starring some of the lead members. Characters like uh, Cyborg, like I said, he gets serious time, which is awesome because Cyborg is a dope character. I love his design. I love his power set. I just, you know, have no issues with him. I'm glad that they kind of made him grow up because in the comics, he's been grown for a long time. And from time to time, he'd help the league. But I don't remember him officially being, maybe he was officially part of the league. So it's kind of strange that they made him in the new 52. They made it a big deal that he's part of the league just seems weird um the part i was talking about with black manta is he monologues with uh aquaman when he could have killed him and then this scene that happened in justice league war ends up happening to black manta and killing him uh like right then and there i mean i don't know if for sure he's dead but considering this is how this universe works he's dead <laughs> for the sake of the you know the the film he's dead and you just felt it was it was straight up comedy to me it was probably the highest point of the film because it was one of those times where you're just like you're you're into it because he was beating the shit out of aquaman and then it was just like boom there it is dead like deep blue sea um i liked how they handled aquaman's mother but i have this this there's this reoccurring theme with the way jeff johns writes people's mothers and i don't know if he has problems with his mother but the moms just disappear get murdered get taken out of the picture in some kind of way so that the single dad is raising the kid. And I'm kind of like, you know, isn't that already a cliche in action films? My mother died when I was three. Mother left us when I was five. Like, really? We're going to do that with all the DC folks now? It's, I don't know, it's kind of weird. It's not my cup of tea. I honestly like variety, and I feel like dumbing them down to the point where everybody has this similar cliche background even though this is action-based stories you know these are action-based stories it bothers me now a uh an area that i will say is freaking you know awesome would be the voice acting just about everybody was freaking believable freaking shazam steals every scene he shows up in um ocean master ocean master was really well done too i mean he was just talking down to people, calling, uh, what's his name, a bastard. It was just like, what the fuck? I mean, he just, he didn't even refer to him by his first name. He just was like, bastard. Well, bastard, you won't have to deal with this. You bastard because blah, 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 blah. And you're just like, damn. And then, you know, he's saying this and he turns around and he hands him his ass. It's pretty dope. I was like, wow. Um, Batman, you know, Jason Omara, he felt like a smart, gruff you know, all business Batman, and it, it worked, you know, he still seemed kind of like, uh, how do I put this, the new 52 Batman seems to be the kind that knows when he cannot win, and he, he thinks a little bit more, you know, whereas the, the, the regular universe Batman has the God complex to the umpteenth degree, so he's not going to accept that he can't win, so he will fight and fight and fight and fight until he finds a way to win or until he dies, so here, you see a lot of that with Batman, although Batman doesn't really play a part in the end game. He shows up in the Batwing, shoots some stuff, you know, they go back to Star Labs. He's more coordinating stuff, you know. Superman was awesome in this. Um, he felt more human and less of a douchebag. I really have felt over the, the last, you know, few years of the, the New 52, that uh, Superman is a douchebag. That's what separates this Superman from the classic Superman is that the classic one would like, you know, pet a little kid on the head, you know, and sit there and hang out with the kid before going to save the world. You know, he would he would do all the little nice things that uh, like a fatherly figure would do, whereas this Superman is like, you know, fuck you, I have shit to do. <laughs> <laughs> and and you know it, it could it could be a generalization it probably it, it is a generalization because i know there are stories in the i want to say the later years the last like two three years where they tried to make him act more like the superman we know but you know my first impression based on the several books i read initially that's what i get you know that's what i feel so um in this he feels more human and they made him awesome i mean when he fights that underwater Cthulhu looking thing. It's pretty dope. He really, uh, you know, 
does his thing. I just hate, though, how because there was magic involved in Atlantis, they kind of, instead of letting you know, like, what things are magic and what things are just energy-based weapons or something, you know, or letting you know if Atlantis is entirely magic-based and not uh, technologically based in any kind of way, they just kind of generalized and everything they had was magic. And it was like, there's got to be a difference because, you know, I've seen in other uh, media, other versions of Atlantis, where they had speeders and they had, when I say speeders, I'm talking about like, almost like underwater jet ski type things. Um, they had, you know, vessels to help carry huge numbers. They, they had, you know, the bio organic tech with like armor and things like that. Like there was a whole mixture of things. And then they had stuff that was like completely magic, only magic, kind of like, uh, in, uh, uh, Young Justice, you saw Calderam and Garth and uh, the chick that they liked. I can't remember her name. You saw them using magic. They were like water bending. They were doing turning the water to ice. They had uh, control over electricity and shit like that. So um, the fact that they didn't really explain what that was, you know, like the difference between their tech or the fact that they generalized kind of made things unbelievable for me. But I was just like, you know, I'm just going to let it ride and watch the film. Then one of my homeboys, uh, my homeboy, uh, Zeke, he brought over the movie and, uh, he was talking about how he didn't get, uh, or he raised the question, how is it that the new 52 Wonder Woman is the daughter of Zeus and, uh, there is no mention of Poseidon. You, you see them talk about, you hear Wonder Woman and Superman talk about Olympus or Wonder Woman talks about Olympus to Superman. You hear, uh, uh, them mention, she mentions that the Greeks know of, uh, Atlantis, you know, and you know that Hades is there and you know that, you know, uh, Ares and all of them exist, but then where's Poseidon and how come Poseidon has no mention when it comes to Atlantis? You know what I'm saying? Like, what's the deal with this stuff? I mean, maybe they mention it in the comics. I don't remember ever seeing the mention of this in the comics, but like, these are all things that like, when I, when I, dig on, on on Jeff John's work, these are reasons why I don't like it. It's because it's missing things. And, you know, if he, you know, did a good job explaining this in the comics, the guy who adopted his writing for this movie didn't do the greatest job when it comes to little things like that. Also, this team, um, this is the team after, you know, obviously Bruce Tim is long gone from DC and Warner Brothers Animation. And there are things that they did well, you know, this was more consistent, like I said, than um, Justice League War. Uh, the story was a little bit better told, characters were a little bit more fleshed out. And granted, it also has the benefit of being the second in this this group, uh, in, in this series. But um, there are things that you see in this, in this series with this team that you never saw with Bruce Timm and his team, even when he was just producing. It seemed like that crew they understood how to keep everything consistent to the nth degree, where it didn't feel stupid. You know, things like a character's movement, not just how they fight, but how they walk, how they stand, you know, their posture, um, you know, clenched fists, you know, like determined clenched fists versus uh, ready to fight stance with clenched fists. You know what I'm saying? Little things like that. The way, And then the actors, of course, would further that with how they spoke, you know, delivering their lines. Um, the animation in this was really amazing, but there were inconsistencies with how people moved and things they did, you know, in a couple scenes throughout the film, you see that Arthur has no fighting skills, like he wasn't trained, he's just instinctually throwing people and taking punches and blocking and punching and mostly throwing people. Then he puts on the suit and, uh, the, you know, his, his Aquaman gear, and then he's like boxing, and I was like, oh, that's pretty cool. And the animation on that scene was amazing. But then at the end of the movie, he's like twirling his uh, trident around like fucking, you know, Shaolin long staff or long bow stances. And it's like, where did you learn to do that? And why? How did you learn to do that? Why does that like that doesn't even fit with the type of character? You didn't seem like the type of guy to be spinning shit around trying to look fancy. You seem like the I'm going to get this shit done type of guy, you know? Um, 
there are other inconsistencies or, or strange things like why does Mera have on Chun Li's gear from Street Fighter Alpha minus the sneakers? Like Bruce Tim's people would never have done that shit if he was still on the, you know, part of the team. If he was in charge and he was the art director or he was the lead, he would have been like, That looks like Chun Li from Street Fighter, tweak it so that it has some of those aesthetics that you like and it's a completely different thing. I mean, that literally looked like fucking Chun-Li. I'll give you a fucking picture and show you. There's Mera. As you can see, they divided it, you know, green at top, blue, and then she's got the little boot things and wrists, but there's Chun-Li. The basis of Mera's costume is all Chun-Li. I mean, shit like this is what, you know, Bruce Tim would have never let happen, and his people know better, you know what I mean? Whereas, like, having Ethan Spaulding as your director... He can get the action to look right. He can frame the scenes right and whatnot. But, like, he's not getting the whole team to be extremely consistent. Or, what's the word? He's not pushing for, like, their best work. You know, every almost every one of Bruce Tim and company's pieces felt like someone's best work. You know what I mean? Or that group's best work. They each got better. And uh, when he was on board and Ethan Spaulding was involved... He obviously saw that Homeboy would be lax in some of these departments. You know what I'm saying? Uh, and, you know, Bruce Tim has an immense love for the DC Universe. So he would make sure that that shows in everything that he worked on. This kind of, I get that they love it. But there was a lot of things that I was just like, you know, they need to, it's not disrespect. And maybe there is some political thing behind it where Johns will not allow them to do certain things to his writing. But, uh. There should have been some way they could go back and, you know, fill in the holes. You know what I'm saying? Because there are little things where it's just like, come on. All they needed was a scene or a sentence that explains how powerful the freaking trident is and why it's so powerful. And that's it. I mean, we would have been like, oh, okay, I see how he could beat Shazam with that thing. I mean, he turned Billy Batson back into a child with the lightning that he called forth. Like, Why? How did that make sense? You know, I was, we were both like, what? Really? Or like the fact that he one-shotted all of the Justice League members and was able to just take them out like it was nothing. You know, all the ones that were there to fight him. And I'm saying to myself, how does that make sense? And then at the end of the, the fight, he gets knocked out by one punch by Aquaman. It just didn't feel like a satisfying ending. So yeah, the ending sucks. It's kind of like, ugh, you know, really? Um, but the ride is pretty good. So, you know, if you want something to do, something new to watch, check it out. You'd probably enjoy it. It's, um, you know, it's, it's, it's got its, a, a bunch of good parts in it. It's definitely, it, it's like those, those films that you come across randomly. And I've said this a lot, I've noticed in reviews about modern, a lot of these modern films, uh, action films and, and animation and stuff. You know, you come across these films every now and then or in the middle of the day when you're flipping through channels and you're like, oh, that's interesting. So you watch. But my thing is, this will show people once again that, you know, Aquaman's not a, a useless character. He's not a wuss, despite people's lack of understanding of what his power set actually is. But if you really want to see Aquaman go ham on people, watch Justice League Unlimited and watch Flashpoint Paradox. Um, Flashpoint Paradox was the last thing that Bruce Tim was somehow involved in, and you could see it because he not only, him and his crew didn't only translate Jeff John's work, they added to it and made it, like, to me, 100% better. I know uh, uh, Chapman Films, we were talking, he didn't like it very much, but uh, I dug it because when they talk about alternate universes... That was an alternate universe. Nothing was exactly what you remember it, except for the fact that certain characters actually existed in some way, shape, or form. But like all the ways that people interacted, um, the fact that there was no Superman and Cyborg was the closest thing you had to Superman, that was awesome. And then when they showed you what the Superman of that world was, you're just like, that's nothing like the one we know, except for his power set and the fact that he's a white guy with black hair. You know, but like they had to teach him what friends were and shit like that. It was it was awesome. And that's what I mean when I say think of, you know, take the source material, 
take the strong points and if something's weak but it was interesting expand on it and add to it and build it up so that it's better don't just put it in there because it was there and don't even do anything to it you know and that's what this movie suffers from so if you're gonna watch turn your brain off and just be cool you will love this movie because a lot of people did that with justice league war and they were able to enjoy it and i noticed that that's what a lot of people do they just watch the movie like a zombie <laughs> you, you you get this moment to let your intelligence go to sleep you just watch the movie you don't think about what you're watching now the thing that 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 makes this difficult for comic book related films especially the more epic stories is that we read it already so when we see the translation we want to see how well do some of these things actually work or how well did the teams make these things work you know did, is this convincing is it more epic seeing it in animated form or is it less epic seeing it in animated form you know these are all important details that make up the experience of watching these things in animated form and for me uh this this particular team you know their animation it's like the parts are amazing but the whole is not you know what i'm saying the designs phil barasa has been doing his thing since before young justice you know i like his style it's not boring it's awesome to see i like the way he uh tweaks the characters and since young justice when they gave him kind of some creative leeway with the designs he really has been knocking shit out of the park with the look and feel of the characters um you know he maintains the integrity of the original design but he adds things to it so that the, the characters feel new and fresh and in some cases they look better than their counterparts in the uh new 52. but uh you know the animation animation is amazing too and it keeps getting better and there's certain scenes where they just go nuts with the movement and shit and it's just like man this is quality and this is why i'm watching it the sound even the music this time around the music was way better it didn't fall apart nothing felt generic i mean it still wasn't like a, a clear-cut theme but um i enjoyed it <laughs> i enjoyed the music um I think that the music worked on a on a level that accompanied the level of craziness that was happening in the film and the fact that the film had breaks really helped make the the score it really gave the score room to accentuate everything that was happening you know your low points had somber music with these really mellow kind of synths in the background and like running pulsing synths when the action would start to ramp up and I just dug it. I don't know. So that stuff was cool, but the story itself needed some tightening, you know, but you know, like I said before, it's still a fun ride. So check it out. I am Strident and this has been my review of Justice League Throne of Atlantis. Um, I think it's a, I don't know, six out of 10 and that's my story and I'm sticking to it. Like I said, there's little issues here and there, but overall, it's a decent film it's something to pass the time at the very least and it's a badass display of who aquaman is and where he comes from so uh i hope you dug it if you didn't dig it argue with me in the comments and i will catch you on the next video peace outside